Okay, so it's time. So let me start the final talk in this workshop. The speaker is Herbert Spohn from Technical University of Munich. He's going to tell us uh, hydrodynamic equations for the discrete nonlinear Schrodinger equation in one dimension. So please start. Thank you very much. I mean, thank you very much for this invitation and uh, the opportunity to present uh, some of my results. Before I um, sort of, you know, start with the actual topic, I just want to make um, sort of uh, two general remarks. I mean, as you can see, this is sort of concerned with um, uh, hydrodynamic uh, scale of, uh, of integrable system, which has been a very active area. And um, uh, I have sort of two motivation by, by still sort of think it's, it's an interesting topic and uh, I'm working on it. So the, the first motivation is that, uh, you know, everybody in the field sort of believes that once I go to the hydrodynamic scales, it, the distinction between, you know, very diverse integrable systems actually disappears and on, on the hydrodynamic scale, they look more or less alike. Now, when you look at the evidence, of course, you know, we have five, six, seven systems which have been studied and, and where one can sort of uh, believe that such kind of, uh, you know, sort of universal behaviors actually go back. But I think it, you know, would be nice to add further models uh, to this list. And, and so this is what I'm going to do in the talk today. Now, uh, this will be uh, on a classical system. I mean, it's sort of a nonlinear wave equation. And if you really are looking for, you know, sort of, um, I mean, real life uh, verification, I mean, you know, confirming uh, generalized hydrodynamics in, 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 in actual labor laboratory setup, then presumably going to quantum systems uh, is, uh, is the good bet. But um, when you ask for a sort of a numerical confirmation of the theory, then I think, you know, classical system have a lot to offer. I mean, despite the fact that, uh, you know, there have been amazing progress in, in the MRG type techniques and, and uh, of course people are further improving, but, but I think, uh, you know, sort of classical simulations of classical systems are sort of um, more flexible and you can sort of more detailed, you know, uh, sort of uh, investigate uh, you know, questions confirming or non-confirming the theory. Okay, so being, this being said, I sort of um, want to focus now on this um, nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And um, so here you can see the equation. So, so this is, uh, I mean, people always say NLS. I mean, it's still focusing. I mean, that's sort of the plus sign sitting over here. So it's a stable situation, sort of dynamically, sort of more modest situation. If you go to the focusing scheme, despite the words, I mean, you know, the, the dynamics is sort of um, much more complicated. So you stay with um, a defocusing case. Um, so I put down here no scattering theory. So, uh, you know, I take a large finance system, uh, but, but the system is confined. So if I wait sufficiently long, eventually it will reach some sort of um, a statistical uh, stationary state, I mean, which sort of statistically, I mean, the dynamics is moving, but the state itself is uh, statistically uh, invariant under the dynamics. And uh, so for this purpose, I have to start with random initial data. And uh, of course, an energy, which is sort of um, proportional to the volume and, uh, you know, what people like to call it, it's sort of highly excited. I mean, so yeah, I'm not, not in investigating bound state behavior, although at the end of the story, maybe, you know, one, one, one could also look at that, but so that, that's of the generic setup. And um, uh, well, let's let's see what, what what the rough idea is. I mean, so the rough idea is that uh, when I look at this system here, I sort of put you know already infinite volume, but but it's not very relevant for this discussion. I mean, so so, so the idea is that when, when 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 I look at such kind of systems, sort of infinitely extended, they are natural sort of measures which are space-time stationarity and then, you know, in order to have space-time, I mean, typically you want to look at, at both sort of, you know, being completely extended, okay? So, so that, that's fine. I mean, of course, we have many examples of that and we will get more. But now the idea is that if you want to look at dynamics, I mean, then you, you're looking at the situation, which of course is uh, not, not stationary. I mean, things should be moving. And the idea is that you construct the initial measures 
which sort of locally look like one of the space-time stationary states. But when you look on a more global macroscopic scale, then of course, let's say something like the mean energy is varying as a function of space. And I put here X, I mean, all my systems are, are one-dimensional because I'm looking at integrable systems, okay? integrable many-body systems. Now, the idea, the, the simple postulate or the idea or sort of, you know, something, of course, which has been around for a very, very long time is that this kind of local stationarity, which you can put into the initial data, or which maybe the system sort of reaches by itself, but let's assume that we put this into the initial data, that this actually will satisfy closed equations. And those are the famous hydrodynamic equations, you know, applicable to a large variety of systems. He wanted to do it for the integrable systems, which is actually an evolution equation for the parameters which are labeling the stationary states. So first you have to understand what are the natural stationary states, and then you assume uh, slow variation uh, of uh, the parameters, and then you get close evolution equations. So let's have a look at, at sort of the case which uh, we are most familiar with, namely, sorry. Uh, this is the, the wrong direction. Uh, no. Uh, Okay, here we are. So let, let's look at uh, the case which we are most familiar with, which is sort of a one-dimensional fluid, where of course you have number, momentum, and energy as, as your conserved fields, and then you can write down the Euler equations. All what I'm going to do today will refer to the Euler time scale, so it's ballistic time scale. And of course, uh, we have uh, then three coupled hyperbolic conservation laws on the macroscopic scale. And in order to write them down, of course, you need a little bit on the, on the thermodynamics of the system in particular, you would need, you know, the pressure as a function of, of uh, let's say, the density and the internal energy. Now you want to sort of, uh, you know, transpose this kind of scheme, which, which uh, everybody believes in and which, uh, you know, is very successful to integrable systems. And then, of course, uh, the main difficulty is that rather than three, we have sort of potentially infinitely many proportional to the volume. Um, uh, conservation laws and that sort of, you know, requires some some uh, extra efforts. And of course, you know, the pressure by itself will be not enough. I mean, we have to compute something like a generalized free energy. Okay? Now, of course, it's a big step to claim that, you know, uh, going from three to infinity and then, the, you know, there could be something going wrong. But by all what we know, and you know, by now we have a lot of experience, I mean, this seems to be sort of the right direction. And so now I'm going to try to explain what this step to you know means in the particular context of the nonlinear um, of the nonlinear Schrödinger equation. Yeah. All right. So now let's uh, have a look at, at what these um, uh, generalized Gibson ensembles are. So I'm, I'm still sort of working here in the continuum language, and so we have conserved fields. I mean, which you can look up in the books, and uh, of course the first ones you you guess immediately. Uh, so, uh, you know, you have the density, I mean, there's uh, sort of uh, bilinear objects, which are the momentum, which is here the minus i d d x, and uh, 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 that you have the, 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 the second conserved quantity is the energy, so you have here the elastic energy, and then you have here the potential energy. And of course, I, I've written down here the densities, and if you want to get sort of sort of the, the total objects, I mean, then you know, if I want to get the total energy, the total uh, with, uh, what's happening here? Um, I, <laughs> uh, okay, I will learn that. Okay, so uh, if I look at at uh, at, um, at the total energy, let's say, then I have to integrate over my volume, so so that sort of uh, uh, makes it confined. And then uh, I follow Gibbs and, and uh, just put uh, the, the total conserved quantities in the exponential. And if I have three, I have three sort of type chemical potentials. Of course, one of them would be the inverse temperature. And the other one is the ordinary uh, chemical potential for the, uh, for the density. And uh, these are, so to speak, the control parameters in, 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 in my Gibbs ensemble. And uh, uh, well, that, that, that you can do, and then and then now you can first wonder why whether you know such kind of somewhat singular object exists. I mean, you know, here I put an x, oh, uh, that, that's a continuum x over volume, and then of course th this doesn't make much sense. But then you look at you know the expression for your um, conserved quantity, and you see that there's sort of a gradient sitting up here, and so it's clear that that you know we know how to deal with this. I mean, it just becomes a brown emotion, and so there's a lot of work. I mean, the, the first work. Uh, was actually by Leibovitz, Rose, and Spear many years ago, where they sort of, you know, 
showed that, that this kind of idea sort of work very well. And in fact, they are not using integrability. I mean, they're just using the fact that, that the energy has sort of, you know, this extra gradient square term. And so later on, you know, lots of other work, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, it's a whole mathematical industry to make sense out of this. But this is not enough for our purposes. You see, after all, I mean, you know, these are certainly the lowest conserved fields, but we have, in, you know, we have many of them and therefore, you know, just writing down the Gibbs measure in terms of only three conserved quantities would be a sort of a contradiction in itself. I mean, you know, if we wait for a long time, I mean, you know, depending on initial condition, we will go to some steady state, but it's very unlikely that it will be just described exactly by these uh, three parameters. And so we have to go further and uh, we have to, rather than uh, stopping at n equal to two, I mean, we have to go to, to, uh, to higher orders and in principle, you know, I mean, maybe one, in principle one should go up all the way to infinity. I mean, depending how you make exactly the setup. Okay, so, but now comes the problem. I mean, so when you look at the list, which I haven't further displayed, so I look for instance at Q3, then you see that, that there are higher gradients. I mean, you, you get rather than second order, I mean, you get third order gradients. And if you go further, I mean, you, you know, you're, the, the, the higher the gradients are. And then writing down these measures, I mean, it's sort of essentially a mathematical impossibility unless you do some, you know, very sophisticated, uh, maybe RG scheme, which, uh, which uh, we don't know really how to do, you know, including all, all the other conserved fields. You see, you don't want to be normalized in such a way that we had to get rid of all these parameters. So this is sort of, uh, I mean, so in some sense, you know, the program is stuck already at the first stage. I mean, we don't know how to write down. I mean, we have a candidate, but we cannot make mathematical sense of, you know, what we would think are sort of the physically natural stationary states. So, uh, okay, so <laughs> we still should do something. And so, so there, there's one strategy with which I sort of want to mention here in passing. Uh, by by Shinadi L. I mean, uh, he worked on this this idea for a long time, and so he mostly studied the KDV equation. And his idea was sort of to take as initial state sort of like a gas of solitons. I mean, so so these are already sort of you know objects uh, which have some extension. I mean, made out of uh, sort of you know these are fields which are not localized at single points or so, and. Um, and uh, then he sort of, you know, they, they have parameters, these solitons, so you put them maybe at some random di distance, and then maybe, you know, the speed of the soliton, you also put um, some random parameter, and, and this way you, you get sort of, uh, 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 you know, initial gas of soliton, which is not necessarily absolutely dilute, but, you know, I mean, uh, it has some sort of density, which maybe is not, not too high. And then, then uh, if for such kind of initial conditions, I mean, Al proposed uh, already, I mean, that, that was in 2005 or so. I mean, he proposed already how to write down the correct Euler equations. So this is fine. And it, it's sort of a different uh, spirit than what I'm doing. I think the gas of soliton, I mean, you know, this kind of state which he writes down, which is maybe also natural for certain purposes, is not of the type of a generalized Gibbs ensemble. I mean, these are somehow two different initial type of conditions and so, you know, different methods can be used. So I want to sort of do the more traditional hydrodynamics, which would sort of uh, emphasize that, it, you know, the, the, the natural states are really Gibbs ensembles. And so the only strategy which one can do, at least in my case, is that uh, you have to go to a discretized system. I mean, if, once I put uh, discretized, uh, then, uh, of course, one can write down these generalized Gibbs ensembles. And of course, I, if once I discretize generically, I mean, you lose integrability. But of course, the, the rule is that you should discretize in such a way that you preserve integrability. And surprisingly enough, I mean, this, this uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a specialist in area, but you sort of discover this uh, 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 sort of step after step. And it, it's still surprising that, that apparently all these kind of continu continuum systems have a very natural sort of discretization. And so, uh, you know, actually, and, 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 and therefore, you know, th 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 this step is something which is really available. And for the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, it goes back many years by Aplowitz and Ladek. And so the, the model which I'm going to look at actually will be uh, the Aplowitz Ladek discretization of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And again, in passing, I want to mention that there's uh, some beautiful work, uh, you know, I mean, the long work by, by uh, first by De Luca and Musato, who was sort of 
thinking of it about the dynamics, but but uh, not so specifically, but you know, investigated this issue of grip smashes and such kind of things. Um, and later on, uh, by by Benjamin and and uh, Takato Yoshimura, and and um, uh, so so they were of course uh, already posing the aspect of of. Um, of generalized hydrodynamics, and they studied uh, another system. I mean, which is the, the Sinch Gordon equation, is also a nice system to look at. And, and somehow they believe that that you know they can get around you know the, the difficulty of exactly defining this generalized Gibbs ensemble. So this, this is not my work. I mean, one 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 should look at that and um, you know see you know how things are matching. That's something for the future. But only as a side remark, I want to mention that that Benjamin Company. At the end of their paper, or maybe the second part of their paper, they actually try to verify, you know, they obtained they obtained generalized hydrodynamic equation through numerical simulations. And of course, in numerical simulations, it's even worse. I mean, how do you are going to simulate sort of you know such a statistical ensembles for a continuum uh, wave equation? And what he did, uh, he actually looked at the, the discretized version of this Sinch Gordon equation, uh, which was uh, found quite some time ago. And, and this apparently seems to be sort of extremely um, uh, applicable. And then for this, you, you can actually run numerical simulations. I don't know how to you know, say more about this particular discrete model, but, but I just want to emphasize that you know, also for the Sinch Gordon equation, there is this rule, you know, there is a, apparently a discrete version which is close, which naively in the continuum limit gives you the continuum equation and which is still integrable. Okay, so now we have to work a little bit, and so uh, so now I have set set the framework, so to speak, and um, now we want to do Abla with Slatik. Okay. All right, so let's see uh, what we do. So here uh, I've written down uh, uh, their discretization, and you see the naive discretization would be to put here psi j uh, psi absolute values squared. I mean, so this would be sort of the naive lattice discretization, which is non-integrable, that breaks uh, uh, integrability. I mean, there you have just uh, the, the usual sort of, uh, you know, uh, energy and density conserved to conservation laws, unless you're at very low temperature where something else is happening. But what he proposes that that uh, rather than, uh, you know, putting here the field at the at the, at the lattice side J. I mean, he just takes the average over the two neighboring sides. Okay, and so so psi, of course, maybe I should say this again. I mean, psi is here a complex valued field, and now uh, since I discretized, uh, I'm sitting on the one-dimensional lattice. So J will be always my lattice index. Okay, so that's the equation, and then you look at this equation for a little while, and then you realize that that you know you can get rid of this uh, linear term just by a simple phase factor. So let's do that. And then usually, I mean, I just follow the standard notation. I mean, this is called uh, uh, alpha, the new field. Uh, and uh, uh, then you see that I put the i on the other side. And then you see that you can write the equation in such a way, uh, because you know here you have both sort of this average. And uh, there's a pre-factor, which is simply 1 minus alpha j squared. And now when you look at this equation and you ask yourself, what is the phase space? Well, it's pretty obvious. You know, as alpha goes to one, I mean, then this term goes to zero. So, so uh, then sort of nothing is moving because it's standing in front of here. And so the natural phase space is actually that alpha is complex valued and it should be in absolute value less than one. So alpha j is sitting on the unit disk. And whenever one of these alphas actually is touching uh, the border of the unit disk, then it sort of gets stuck. And uh, for the statistical data, which I'm going to discuss, I mean, the alpha will never hit the boundary. So you can think of alpha somehow moving in the interior of this uh, unit disk. Okay? And then uh, we want to confine the system. This we do in the sort of trivial way. I mean, we just take a ring of n sides and we put sort of the standard naive boundary conditions, which are good enough for our purposes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, fine. So, so, so we have we have set up the system, and so now the next question is: What are the conserved fields? That, of course, uh, Ablovitz and Ladik investigated already. But when you look at their paper, uh, that's um, uh, useless. I mean, it's very beautiful work. I mean, they, they do inverse scattering, but you see what you get. 
by this method are actually the non-local conserved fields. And then, of course, they realize that, and you know, at the end that they say, ah, you have to do this uh, logarithmic derivative, and then then go from 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 the from the non-local to the local ones. But but they don't carry this out. I mean, and so so in some sense, um, and you know, with, with their information about the conserved fields, of one couldn't do anything. But uh, Irina Nenchu, I mean, this is paper of 2005. I mean, she um, uh, sort of um, uh, was interested in, and, and, and she discovered that, that uh, indeed, I mean, one, 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 one can uh, um, uh, write down the, uh, uh, the conserved quantities by finding a lex pair. Okay, so that's somehow her observation. I'm going to explain exactly what the lex pair is, but let me just sort of emphasize a little bit that, that you know, it, it sort of, the dynamics is sort of, of, of Hamiltonian form. I mean, here I, I go down the Poisson bracket. I mean, there's of course this rho j squared. I mean, rho j is always one minus alpha j squared, right? I mean, uh, there's so to speak a weight in this Poisson bracket, so it's a weighted Poisson bracket. But um, but uh, if you accept this, then sort of the, you know, the usual rules which you know from classical mechanics. I mean, they of course all apply very well. And so, if you want to write down the Hamiltonian of the system, then uh, it's it's quadratic. You see that this this term here, which is in the equations of motion. I mean, this comes because I have this weighted Poisson bracket. But uh, but the H n is just quadratic, and and the, the bar is here the the complex conjugate. I mean, so you know, it has sort of the more or less uh, form which you sort of you know sort of derivative squared. I mean, so it's more or less that form, right? So this is this is the energy, and uh, and 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 these are Newton's equation of motion. Of course, you can also introduce P and Q as real and imaginary parts. But um, uh, you know, at least at that stage, doesn't seem to be too much of a help. I mean, so I'm thinking always of alpha and alpha bar. Okay, so here you see that I, the Poisson bracket is with respect to alpha and alpha bar. I mean, they are sort of considered as independent variables, right? I mean, it's like like Q and P. All right. So now uh, now uh, we come to this uh, conservation law. So uh, so so I mentioned already uh, that um, we want to have local conservation law and and up with like uh, you know we have sort of a different point of view, and they were just happy to get the conservation law by themselves. And since it's such an important thing, I mean, you know, even in this audience, you know, just to make sure that everybody understands this notion. I mean, so what, what I mean by local conservation law is that first of all, so this is a global one, and that's has an index which which I call here little n. So so of course, you know, this this uh, uh, global law can be written as a sum of, over local quantities, right? I mean, this is sort of what I mean by this notation. So J is sort of the lattice index, and when I sum, then I get the global one. And and the crucial assumption is that this is a local function. And, and implicitly, I'm using a notation, which of course everybody somehow knows, but still those people who are not familiar, let me just emphasize this. You see, I mean, it's cannot, you know, for this system, it cannot happen that, that for each J, I have a different function, so to speak. I mean, that of course formally looks like a density, but it would be very inhomogeneous. But there's sort of a translation invariance built into uh, the model. And, and uh, let me just give you an example so that you understand the notation. So if I take a Q0, which is some, some function on phase space, let's say I take this, uh, uh, whatever here, fifth order polynomial, and, and then it's an alpha minus one and one and three, right? I mean, I'll take, take some other uh, example. But then what I mean is that the QJ is simply that, exactly that function, but just shifted by J lattice size. So at lattice size say I just replace this index by J minus one, J plus one, and J plus three. So this is what I mean by having a local density, okay? All right, of course, uh, you know, the values of this field can be very different, but the function itself is just a shift. All right, so we have uh, this uh, sort of uh, explained. And so now comes the question, what about the lag pair? Okay, and that's very beautiful work. I mean, I, you know, I just learned it, uh, uh, more or less by accident, sort of at the beginning of this year, and so so I'm still impressed, you know, when 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 I saw this, and so uh, so the, the beautiful observation is that uh, uh, you can construct the lax matrix by something which are called uh, CMV matrices. That this uh, these are people who invented it. This Cantero, Moral, and Velasquez. So Barry Simon was actually very much um, involved in this discovery. I mean, uh, Irina was uh, his PhD student at the time. And so somehow, you know, in early 2005, I mean, people realized that, that, uh, that, 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 that you know, they, they didn't know so much about Ablovitz Sladek, but of course, um, Irina and, 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 and Barry Simon, they knew about it and um, they somehow discovered this connection. 
So it's very easy to explain what what uh, what the definition is. I mean, so so uh, so we actually have two matrices L and M, and and uh, and, and they are a block diagonal. I mean, so these are little two blocks, and uh, and then they are outside. They are zeros, and of course, if I do periodic boundary conditions, I, I pick up sort of one one extra matrix element out of here, right? but otherwise they're just block diagonal. And so I just have to explain you what the little block is. Well, so let's take this two by two matrix. So this is just a definition. So rho j squared is one minus alpha absolute value squared, and you uh, you look at this two by two matrix, and you immediately realize that uh, it is actually uh, a unitary. Sorry, uh, it's actually a unitary matrix. Okay, and uh, uh, so this is the ln. And now, now the idea is that you take an even number of sides, and then you do blocking zero one, and then. Uh, uh, two, three, etc., and this defines for you the matrix Ln. Okay, so this will be the action leg. No, this is not yet the legs matrix. So this will be Ln. And now, now, now the, the Mn is just sort of exactly the same matrix, but you shift the blocking by one. I mean, that's something which is familiar for many areas. Uh, you know, I mean, okay, okay. I don't want to make the list here, but but I mean, this is sort of uh, you do exactly the simple trick. Okay, and then of course the Mn is just sort of um, it's just a different matrix, of course, also unitary. And the Lex matrix is actually the product of these two. And of course, since both of them are unitary, then the CN is also unitary. Okay. So this means you. Into, so then, uh, then uh, you, you, I haven't written that down. I mean, you, you can write down the equations of motion in terms of um, of a Lex pair. So when I look at the time derivative of something, then uh, then I can write this as a time derivative, let's say, of of C. Uh, or of Cn, but let's say of C. I mean, of the Lax matrix can be written as as a commutator with with some uh, with a second pair. And I have have not written down the pair because it's not so important for us. Okay. And uh, so at the end of the day, I mean, you figure out that um, uh, that the conserved quantities are nothing else but uh, but uh, the n's conserved quantity is nothing else but the n's power of the Lax matrix, and you take the trace. Now, since I've taken the trace, you see that density is obvious. I mean, I just take the diagonal matrix elements, and those are the conserved quantities. So this is what I've written over here. Okay. All right. So so that's fine. I mean, you see that this is of course uh, you know a very very concrete formula, and so that's extremely nice. And you can figure out what uh, what um, uh, the uh, what your energy is, which I've written down before. I mean, that's just sort of. I mean, you know the uh, the, um, uh, the the C matrix is a unitary matrix. So when I take the trace, it in general will be a, a complex number. And so if I take the real part of it, this will just be just exactly the Hamiltonian. Of course, I can take also the imaginary part that will have uh, some interesting consequences, which I'm going to explain. But I mean, at the moment, I'm just sort of mentally, I'm thinking here about um, you know the Hamiltonian, which is just the real part of that matrix. Okay. And now, uh, uh, of course, it, it's sort of pretty obvious, but let me nevertheless sort of go through this um, little slide here. Uh, you know, why is it actually local? Well, that, that's very easy to see. I mean, so here is uh, the nth power of my legs matrix. Uh, you know, I've taken already now n going to infinity. So, uh, so these are um, uh, now just, just the infinite dimensional matrices. And, uh, and uh, the density is just a JJ matri matrix element, right? And um, for this, I can do a random walk uh, representation. So let's say I want to go to from J to J, and because of that sort of uh, particular pairing structure, you know, I have, uh, you know, if I take the nth power, I have um, the matrix L and then M, L, M, L, etc., and therefore uh, I have to do a random walk on a on a checkerboard. I mean, that that comes from because I'm taking this this product over here, right? And the checkerboard. Uh, it has, you know, like every checkerboard has, has white and black uh, um, uh, unit cells, and uh, and the rule of the random walk is that it can never cross a black unit cell, right? So a walk can go here, but then it cannot cross down here. So it's a it's a walk which goes stays constant, goes up or down under the condition that it should never cross um, a black square, and then you 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 give away to this this. Uh, uh, to this walk, I mean, you know, when you go through the diagonal, if this is your lattice side J, I mean, then uh, it has the, the weight rho J. And if you do uh, sort of, if you stay at the same side, then depending whether the, uh, the upper or lower square is black, you either give minus alpha J minus one or the complex conjugate of alpha J. 
and it's that simple rule which uh, allows you to you know sort of uh, you can compute matrix elements if you want to and and uh, well it's just sort of clearly from this you can see that it must be a, a local quantity strictly local quantity you can see that as i increase the power then of course the support of, of the density will sort of increase uh, in uh, in uh, uh, you know, it will just increase linearly with n, and and but but I remind you that that this you know this is not a symmetric matrix. So so, so these these matrix elements are actually complex numbers, and so actually they will define always two conserved fields, right? For each n, there are two conserved fields. All right. So this is, I guess, what we uh, uh, can do. And now, of course, there must be something like like. Um, uh, like a density, and indeed there is a density. So there's one conserved quantity which I call log intensity for the, you know, the, I don't have any good name, and, and uh, the density doesn't sound right either. But anyway, I mean, so so I call it intensity. But you know, there's a logarithm. I mean, intensity because sort of somehow the amplitude of the field is involved, and then so, I should, so you take the logarithm. So I call it log intensity. So that's just the, the log of the OJ square, and you verify immediately. That this is uh, um, uh, is actually has vanishing Poisson brackets, and so uh, if I take the exponential, you get uh, um, uh, something which is in the invariant under Uplovitz static dynamic, and you see it's particularly simple because it's just uh, uh, you know the energy was already linear, but here it's sort of you know just just out of zero so to speak. I mean you know it's just uh, on-site objects, and so when I take the exponential, I mean you get a product measure. And so this is what I call the a priori measure. I mean, this is a apparently quite general structure that that uh, you know the, the, these integrable models have sort of a natural a priori measure. I mean, you know, if, if it's Hamiltonian, it would be just left back. But here we have um, a slightly more complicated situation. I mean, the the, the left back would, would would be not you know the uniform measure would be not uh, not uh, the, the correct candidate. Uh, uh, I mean, this happens also for the Torda when you go to the flush variables. Anyway, so so. So here you see that that, uh, that that there's sort of a natural a priori measure, and, and in most cases there's sort of naturally a parameter, which in the total that is is actually very close to the physical pressure. So I also call it capital P. And so you see that that this a priori measure has sort of one non-trivial uh, scaling parameter, which which is this number p. And in order for this to be integrable, uh, you want to have p to be uh, positive. Okay. All right. So, so now, 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 now we can write on uh, the Boltzmann weight. I mean, this is what I promised to you. And so, uh, if I just use sort of you know uh, calculus of matrices, then you see that uh, I can write this infinite sum, which is always cumbersome, much easier as a function of C n. And this I call here v hat. But if I want to use it as a weight, then maybe it should. Be real and so you know the, the Fourier coefficients of that function. Uh, I have to impose this symmetry, so, so this extra condition, so that actually the trace happens to be a real quantity. And then I'm done. I mean, I have the a priori measure. I have uh, my Gibbs weight, and then I take uh, I normalize this, and that's what it is. Okay. So later on, it will be not the V hat, which is a PI, but, but I mean, basically this quantity here, I'm actually not sure what the difference is anyway. So, okay, so, so I want to emphasize that, that the, the, the GGE has two labels, one of them sitting in the a priori and the other one, which gives sort of, uh, which is the function of the Lex matrix, which is this uh, CMV matrix. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so you have sort of, you know, an infinite number of degrees of freedom because there's a whole function sitting up here. All right. Okay, so now, now comes sort of some of the most important, uh, sort of conceptually most important uh, part of uh, the talk. I mean, of course, uh, you know, some of, of you know these things, but, but, uh, but, but let me sort of, uh, sort of go through this because uh, I, I think it's sort of good to have also a physical picture of what's going on and then we can continue with, with the formulas. Okay, so so so, so I mean, uh, now I, I like this, this notion of what I call the Lex filter. So so what, 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 what do I mean by this? I mean, what I mean by this is that, I mean, you know, take your Apple and then put some whatever independent uh, 
IIT uh, initial conditions and then simply run it for a little while. And then you look at, at, at the configuration which you see. And that's, of course, you know, pretty noisy. I mean, you know, you, you, you would not discover so immediately, you know, any particular structure. But now I apply the lax filter. Now, what does the lax filter mean? Well, the lax filter means that I take a little subsystem, maybe 400 sites, and out of the, you know, the, the, the microscopic data, which I have in this box of uh, a cell of 400 sites, I form the lax matrix according to the prescription which I have given to you. And then I, this is a unitary matrix, and then I determine the eigenvalues which are sitting on the unit circle. So I determine this phase itself, the uh, theta J. And now the claim is that uh, this, this by themselves will be actually sort of, you know, still, uh, I mean, if I really look at the precise index, you know, might be a somewhat singular quantity, but Sorry, I mean, this is my computer here. Uh, but um, the quantity which is slowly varying is actually the density of the state. So I just do the one over n, I normalize them, and, and uh, I, I, the phases so of the w will be now between 0 and 2 pi. And, and it's the density of states which, which, which is sort of, the, the, the sort of the result of the lax filtering of observation. Okay, so I first compute the eigenvalues and density of states. And then now the claim is that under, under, under my assumptions, under the dynamics of, of uplovitz ladek it's the density of states which will have a slow variation. And it's the density of states which is governed by a hydrodynamic equation. So rather than you know, the Gibbs measure, which is sort of a more probabilistic thing, now you have sort of uh, the label of the Gibbs measures, which is uh, the pressure and this, this confining potential, which I call V. Now, from this, you go over to uh, what is the average value of the intensity field, which I call new, and the average value of the conserved field. And it's those quantities which have a slow variation, right? I mean, so here I've written down what the, the definition of the new is. I mean, it's just sort of the, the average of the log. And um, of course, uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 if I just go through this, this algebra, then, then you see that, that what I call here the density state is just of, sort of, uh, I mean, it, I mean the, the conserved quantities are sort of, sort of, will just give you the, the, the Fourier coefficients of, of the density of states. So, so there's a simple relation. But the main point is that, um, that uh, the, through the lax filter, I have identified what are the slowly varying quantities. And now you have a very simple pictures. I mean, of course, you get hydrodynamic equations, which I actually will never write down in this talk because there are other things which I would like to explain. But, but the physical picture is very clear. I mean, so here's my space time. I take a little patch here. I observe uh, on the macroscopic scale the particular intensity and, and, and the value of the conserved field. So better, I conserve the density of states of the lax matrix. I mean, this is what I'm really observing, so to speak, with my instrument in quote. And, and, and then the assertion is that, that uh, first of all, there's a closed equation for these quantities. It's now like in kinetic theory, you have uh, space, time, and then you have sort of like a velocity type variable, but you know, it's more complicated. It is sort of the parameter with, with which tells you what is the density of states of the lax matrix. And then this is sort of persisting in time everywhere I look. And of course, locally, the statistics of the particles is given by GGE. Okay, so that's uh, that's the picture. And now, now we have to do a little bit more work, namely we want to sort of actually figure out um, how we can um, get these kind of things. And um, uh, then there's a, a beautiful paper in the same time by Kili Benenchu, which sort of, um, uh, do what, what I call now transformation of measures. I mean, what, what this means is that un under the a priori measure, you want to compute the density of states. I mean, you want to compute what is the distribution. No, sorry. You want to compute what is the full probability distribution of the eigenvalues of your lax matrix. Now, and this is this is a probability distribution which lives on the faces and 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 uh, and and uh, if I had to ask the question like this, I, nobody knows how to answer. You see, this is not the correct a priori measure. The a priori measure is sitting up here, the minus one plus p. You know, it's just it's it's independently identically distributed. Okay. But, 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 but this, I mean, nobody knows how to do the computation, but, but what they succeeded is when I put, put here a linear ramp, I mean, so it's, it's no longer in identical, you know, it's just sort of the, the parameter which is sitting up here is changing linearly with my, uh, with, uh, with my space index. Then you can do this sort of uh, uh, computation. So here I wanted to indicate that this parameter is sort of actually varying linearly. 
And then what they find is that actually you can write it in terms of a fundamental determinant. Now it's in terms of, of the phases. So this is what in, uh, in, in uh, the matrix theory is called the circular unitary ensemble. So this was studied already by Dyson. And the beautiful thing is that, that under this measure, you can actually uh, uh, obtain a, the full distribution. Okay, okay, okay. okay. And now constant, and therefore I put the beta like one over n, then, you know, the slope is very small and locally it will look exactly like the measure which I want to do. And uh, since I have here this way, then I put here the beta, uh, which in usual random matrix here, this is considered to be sort of, you know, a given parameter. Uh, I put this parameter like one over n, so I'm actually ending up with uh, what is called uh, sort of, you know, the, the high temperature or mean field type scaling in random matrix theory. And therefore, you know, uh, you, you can accomplish the result. Namely, I can sort of um, compute what is the generalized free energy and I can compute, uh, given my confining potential, I can compute what is, um, um, the density of states and, and the result is, is quite simple. I mean, so, so you know, when you look at the weight, I mean, this, this comes from, from the Boltzmann weight, which, which was linear, linear in V, I mean, therefore you have a linear term. The, the logarithm comes from the fundamental determinant. And then, of course, because I'm, I'm looking at high temperatures, you know, sort of, sorry. Uh, temp uh, uh, temperature and 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 uh, and uh, and um, uh, energy, uh, uh, so, so to speak, this term and the entropy are term of the same order, and therefore you know uh, I have to include that entropy term. And now 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 it's sort of just sort of a problem on, on doing finding the minimizer. So here I minimize over all those uh, which are normalized to one and and are positive. There's a unique minimizer in this case. Uh, and then if I want to compute what is the density of states of the lax matrix because of the linear ramp, uh, you know, I have to do this operation. I multiply by P and then differentiate with P and this will be the, 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 the matrix. Okay, then there are also average carbons, which I don't want to go into uh, because I'm not going to write down the hydrodynamic equations, but uh, anyway, that can be done. Uh, and uh, okay, so, so let me not, not emphasize that. I just want to mention that, that it, it happens, um, it happens, uh, it must happen sort of, uh, at least with me, I presume with other people also that, that, you know, when you finish your paper and you're very proud, then you discover that somebody else is doing something similar at the same time. And so, so this happened here also. So there's uh, Masuka and Grava. I met them here at the, um, I met them here at the, at the MS, I met them here at the MSI. And, uh, and, um, and uh, they actually uh, they discovered also the, the, this connection and, and uh, um, basically they are, they are sort of also writing down this, this uh, mean field functional. I mean, then the later on things on hydrodynamics and carbons, of course, you know, this was not in their scope, but I just want to say that if you can look, look at that paper, which is also instructive. Okay, so far so good. Now I want to do one thing uh, uh, in, in the remaining minutes, namely, I want to go to a somewhat different system, namely... Um, uh, Herbert? Uh, Herbert? Yes. Uh, uh, so just uh, one question. Just one. In the previous slide, uh, do, you, do you have an expression for Rostar? Uh, you have a final expression? Well, for no, no, well, I mean, if, if, if you... Okay, so uh, maybe, maybe okay, maybe I, I didn't explain this. No, of course, in general, not. I mean, so so um, uh, you know, in general, you just have to do a numerical simulation in order to find the minimum of this functional. However, when you look in the Masuko and Grava paper, I mean, that's something with which they did, and I, I didn't uh, sort of really think about it so hard. Is that uh, you? You can uh, you can actually uh, so so. It, uh, um, so you can find, okay, so you, there, there, there is a fairly explicit formula. Um, uh, as long as I make this potential here uh, linear. So then, uh, then uh, there's something called the Hoyne equation. So you can read this in this paper. I mean, so, so in the case, you know, when, when I take the simplest possible potential, uh, I mean, uh, I can also take zero. I mean, that, that's also a meaningful thing. I mean, that there's different work which have sort of studied the case when B is equal to zero. Uh, but then also for the linear V, there is sort of, uh, you know, uh, 
an expression, but but when you ask the numerical people, they look at this expression, they say, okay, I better do a numerical simulation of this equation rather than figuring out how to 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 evaluate it, this uh, uh, you know sort of special functions, right? But but still, I mean, so in these cases, I mean, you have an explicit analytic expression. Okay. They, I mean, in this paper, you can find some plots. I mean, so um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. okay but beyond that, I mean, you have to to solve numerically this thing, right? So, Okay. All right. So now I go to the last part of the talk, which which is sort of um, uh, what I call here the modified uh, KDV. I mean that's uh, uh, I mean it's that particular equation, which you know it's the same same philosophy again. I mean uh, it's a continuum equation, and of course this continuum equation is integrable. But, uh, but uh, you know, by this uh, hydrodynamic methods, I mean, I don't know what to do with this equation. So, so uh, I'm going to do again, sort of, I mean, this uh, is logic. I mean, I'm going to use at the discretization and, uh, uh, and, and then analyze that case. Okay, and then the, uh, what you can read in uplevitz logic already is that what I mentioned, you know, before it was sort of the, the, the real part of the, of the CMV matrix, and now I can take also the imaginary part. And so this would be the imaginary part, and now I can look at the time evolution under this particular thing. And then ablevitz Ladek sort of argue that when you go to the continuum limit, you get the modified KTV equation. And if you look now at the discretization, you see it sort of looks like this. And, 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 and now you observe that, I mean, you know, the eye somehow has disappeared because there's an eye sitting here. And now you observe that when you look at this equation here, then, uh, 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 you know, if I start with real alpha, then it stays real. You know, just everything is real, right? Before, when I put here a plus sign, if I start with real data, they will come immediately complex. But here, real go to real, okay? And it's, it's the continuum limit of that equation, which formally gives you this one up here, all right? So, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 so now we have sort of, um, uh, phase space is much smaller, so to speak. I mean, rather than having alpha on the on, on the unit disk in the complex plane, it's now sitting interval minus one one. Now, of course, you know all the algebra. You know, I mean, about these matrices and all that. I mean, this is just algebra, and, and it just doesn't care whether alpha is real or complex. And so, you know, the definition of the CMV matrix, all these things uh, yeah, are completely identical. I mean, I don't know how one writes on the Poisson bracket because now you know one half of your 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 uh, canonical variable sort of has disappeared, but but uh, maybe this can be also the one. But the thing which I want to point out is that that you know in terms of our original CGE, you know real alpha are clearly a set of measures zero. I mean, you know it's just sort of so 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 you know we we do this nice computation before, but it doesn't say anything about this particular case because it's set of measures zero, right? If I start with real alpha. It would be just totally insensitive, right? I mean, you know, the, the, the sort of, it doesn't say anything. And therefore, you see that, that what I have to do is I have to redo now my, my analysis. I have to sort of take seriously that we start with, 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 uh, with um, real alpha, and uh, then I have to do the analysis, okay? And so let, let's do this. I mean, so uh, now you see that, that there will be a pairing because um, uh, you know, it's a unitary matrix, but it's real, and therefore, you know, if 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 uh, if e to the theta is an eigenvalue, also the complex conjugate will be an eigenvalue. So you see that there's already an extra symmetry, and so rather than having to look at all eigenvalues, it's sort of just look at the eigenvalues in one unit and in in one um, uh, semicircle. All right, and now uh, you do you do this transformation of meshes again. And now it's a little bit more tricky, but fortunately, for some reason, which sort of is a miracle to me, but but somehow you know they, they realized that there would be an interesting case. I mean, this is also in the in the original Kilib and, and Denshu paper. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, the a priori meshes. measure, right? I mean, so we, there was here sort of a minus one P. It's just the same thing, only that the alpha are not living on, on, on the unit interval rather than on, on the complex plane, right? I mean, so, so this looks the same, uh, but, but then you get so, some other factors which are sort of a little bit more complicated. And, and, and then you real, realize that, that uh, you know, rather than uh, looking at theta, if you look at as your independent variable, the, the cosine of theta, which is fine because I'm looking at the, at the semicircle, 
then uh, in terms of this, actually, you 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 get a uh, you get a very uh, nice expression, namely uh, you get again the fundamental to the power beta. But now uh, you get a different different a priori measure. Before we just had, had the ordinary you know volume measure on the unit list, but now you get this particular combination, which which uh, people discover as whatever Jacobi matrix ensemble. I mean that that's a, one of the standard matrix ensemble, which when you look at the matrix sort of you know in, in this world of, of of random matrices that, that that's you know there's a lot there's there are the Gaussians. I mean there are uh, the, the CUEs, uh, but but then, um, you know, then there's also this kind of ensemble here, right? Okay, so what is now the final answer? Well, you have to, to uh, you have to fit your, your coefficients that, that, you know, again, locally, it, it sort of looks, looks, uh, looks uh, uh, uniform. And so I'm doing the same trick again. I mean, so now the beta, of course, is like one over n, but the a and b, they have to be very close to minus one. Uh, that's of slightly singular because at minus one, uh, you will, uh, the, the, the a priori measure is no longer integral. I mean, you know, it, it's one, it, it's one over one minus x squared. So you have sort of on both sides, you have a singularity. And so, 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 so actually, I'm, at the moment, I'm not, not completely sure, you know, how serious that is. I mean, uh, I have somebody here at the MSI, I mean, who knows about these things. So I hope we, we figure this out, but I'm pretty sure it will come out the way you are state. So, so now you, you, you get, you know, the same kind of thing. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not too much different. And now, of course, uh, I mean, the lock looks slightly different. You know, there's no translation invariant anymore because it's now somehow, you know, the, you have the symmetry, which sort of, you know, breaks for you. Uh, th this kind of uh, uh, translation invariance on the circle, which you had before, that was e to the minus i minus e to the minus i w prime. I mean, that sort of depends only on the difference of the angles, but here it doesn't anymore. But then you pick up this extra term here. This, this comes from, uh, sorry, this comes this comes from 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 this term here because now you have an upper your measure, and that's something which nobody ever observed that that you know the the, the bare confining potential gets now a convection. Which is uh, which is only uh, you know which is linear, and you see that you first might worry because you know this this one wants to pile up the eigenvalues at the two boundaries, and it in fact does so very strongly. If I just re remove that term here, you now it it would diverge. It wouldn't make any sense. I mean, there would be no no uh, no good minima. And the minimizer would be just a, uh, the minimizer would be just the delta function at, at 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 the two ends. But now I have this repulsive term, and then you can sort of at least from the exact solution. I mean, you can check that that uh, you know the repulsive term sort of overcomes sort of you know the, the this this very negative sort of attractive team at the boundary and so eventually you will have a, a, a smooth solution okay okay so this is what i'm saying here the boundary attraction is balanced for bike repulsion okay and so um you uh, you uh, just uh, go ahead i mean you you do the same way to to uh, generalize hydrodynamics i mean i put here that uh, you know even for this system when I take the time derivative of, of the log intensity, it will be, a, uh, it, it will have a carbon which itself is conserved. You see, this is like the energy and so will be conserved. All right. So this brings me sort of uh, more or less to the end. So I just want to uh, sort of, um, there's still one more slide where I want to sort of, you know, sort of back up a little bit from, from, from what I found here and, and try to um, sort of put this into context. And so there are, there are, there are, there are Two things, which actually uh, I believe I listed here. Okay, so 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 the first the first point is uh, sort of um, just a general observation. I mean, so you know when uh, sort of uh, I studied in quite some detail. I mean the, the total lattice, which of course uh, you know is, is is rather similar. I mean the, the Lex matrix in this case is a Jacobi matrix, and so not a CMV matrix, but otherwise. You know, the, the Jacobi matrix sort of plays the same role as the CMV matrix, but the, 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 the matrix ensemble, which I get is GUE, right? I mean, that's sort of, uh, you know, when you, when you look at the formulas, I mean, this is just a log gas, which corresponds to uh, high temperature GUE, okay? Well, now here we found another example, which is nice. I mean, we found uh, for the oven with static, we found the CUE, at high temperature, I look at the modified KDV, I find the COE. Well, I mean, you know, if you sort of come more from the random matrix side, I mean, you might wonder whether, what about other 
matrix ensembles. I mean, is there sort of uh, an underlying dynamics where you get GOE or maybe Lake or, or, or you know whatever? I mean, so uh, anyway, so so that that's more more a sort of question of of uh, you know sort of structure of integrable systems. I mean, somehow you would think that that you know that there must be something. Maybe we don't know it, or maybe it's in the literature somewhere, and, and we only have to find out. But um, you know, the guess would be that that, that you know that, that there must be such kind of objects. But uh, at the moment, I just simply don't know. Okay, so so the other one is sort of uh, um, sort of more more question for specialists. But, but I said we would point out. I mean, um, it sort of at least to me, sort of it, it uh, uh, puts a puzzle, and so so. Uh, let, let, let's look now at this uh, generalized hydrodynamics and uh, of course one of the central quantities and sort of you know the big discovery five year back is that that one, one knows how to write down the average currents now now this I didn't explain but I'm just saying that by the methods we have I can do also the average currents for the for both for the modified KTV and 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 uh, for the uh, for the Aplovitz Ladek uh, for the uh, discrete NLS and, and so so I know what the effective velocity is right I mean, so so let's let, let's look at, at at what people say about the Toda right or, or, or and other integrable systems I mean if you look at the you know, vision paper by by Benjamin he, just, he discusses that already I mean there's always the formula for the effective velocity and then the, the, the sort of in the more most general form it's sort of written like like uh, um, uh, you know, there's a dispersion relation for energy momentum in some parameter form, and you differentiate with the parameter, you get a new function, and then you do the dressing. Now, the dressing operator involves this this T operator, which has a kernel which is given by the log of W minus W prime for the total lattice, and then you you just sort of I'm not going to define for you the dressing, but you do this dressing transformation, and then that that simple formula gives you. Uh, well, I mean, in this case, uh, of course, for the total, the dispersion relation is just, uh, uh, these are just classic particles, so it's just one half v squared. And so if you differentiate, you get here the constant function, you get the linear function, you do the tracing, you take the ratio, and this gives you the effective velocity. And that's, of course, a beautiful and simple formula. And in fact, it's even more simple because you see, you don't have to go through any kind of complicated matrices. I mean, the claim is that this function is nothing else. Now, which can be computed by the two-particle scattering shift. So, so here, you know, I, I put here this picture. So you have uh, uh, two particles, uh, and then, 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 you know, you solve just a two-particle problem, and then you realize that, that you know, when you compare this with the corresponding uh, uh, dynamics of point particles, I mean, you see that, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's, there's a shift of order one. I mean, this is what, what, what you call the two-particle scattering shift. And when you look at any quantum model, I mean, you know, when, when you do beta ansatz, the first thing what you have is, is the two-particle scattering shift. So, so in all the models which we have studied, I mean, this two-particle scattering shift, you know, uh, plays to speak a magic role. And 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 so it does here. I mean, you don't have to go through any, you know, whatever complicated, you know, lax random matrices. I mean, you just you just take what you computed from these two particles, and then you immediately get effective velocity and you write on your hydrodynamic equation you sort of bypass any kind of difficulties you know if you believe in the recipe okay now let's try to do the recipe for the for the Ablovitz Ladek well the Ablovitz Ladek I mean you know as I told you I mean you know it's it's the kernel of, of the CUE right and when you when when I, when I do the analysis which I haven't shown is then I use this T operator and I compute uh, uh, the trust uh, sine function and the trust constant function. Right? I mean, that looks a little bit like like over here. I mean, that's one and then that's a sign, uh, but you know, so you can see the energy is sort of like the cosine and then the momentum, you know, it's derivative is something like sine, but then, then you know, if you really believe that, I mean, then you should put down here the cosine rather than sine. So, so it, it doesn't, doesn't really work so well. And then the other even more puzzling thing is that that uh, I have this Ablevitz Ladek model. I mean, of course, I can look at at two sides. I mean, I, you know, I, uh, no, nobody stops me to somehow look at, at the system at two sides. But but what what is the two particle scattering? So so I don't know. I don't know how to do this bypassing. Right? I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, they are just living on this unit distance. So maybe maybe I have to use sort of you know clever coordinates. I mean, maybe there is something which which one can do. I'm not, I'm not saying that that. Um, um, you know, there's no no solution. But what I want to say is that that if I just look naively at the results, it doesn't seem to fit. 
so 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 there must be some 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 something else going on here you know i mean some some other mechanism which allows me to use also this simple recipe so that's just something for the future and then I, the moment i don't have any answers so maybe when i give the next talk uh, on this topic maybe maybe there will be some solution i just don't know i just want to point out that there is sort of at least for me sort of an interesting point to think about so anyway thank you very much for listening and Yes, thank you very much for a very nice talk, Ebert. So now, so now uh, the session is now open for questions and comment. If you have a question, raise your hand. Uh, Krani? Yeah, hello. So when you introduce these alpha variables for the uh, Ablovitz-Ladic model, Yes. The, I mean, the phase space in these alpha variables looks compact. Correct. But in the original psi variables, the phase space is not compact, right? Correct. So, I mean, what happens here? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you see, you are asking whether, if I have the lattice model, whether I can, at least so that's, I interpret your question. And I take the lattice model whether I can take sort of some sort of, you know, continuum limit, and say something about the continuum equation, right? So no, th but this, I mean, the phase space is non-compact on all the lattice, right? On each single side, the psi variable yeah. is. Uh, I mean, the the, the 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 limit must be such that you know I, I let the lattice spacing go to zero, and at the same time, the unit disk goes goes to infinity. Yeah, mm. that, that, that's what you have to do. I mean. I, I, on, on the level of, of, of the hydrodynamic, uh, let's say on the level on the level of this of this um, uh, density of states of, of the CMV of the lax matrix, um, the, the, you can actually see that. You see, if I if I you know, it's basically going going if, uh, there. What you would do is you would go from this T operator to this one, right? I mean, you see, this is living on the on on, on the real line, so to speak, and this is still living on the unit circle. So if I look at an initial distribution. On the unit circle, which, which doesn't know that it's on the circle, but it's sort of reasonably concentrated, then it will be governed by this kernel here. So, so you know, on the level of the hydrodynamic equation, I can make actually this continuum limit, and then I get sort of the, the one from from the from the total. But uh, on the level of, of you know the original model, uh, you know, I, I, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't really know how to do that. I mean. mm -hmm. Okay. But you see, if I would, would go through, through the formalism which I have, I mean, then of course at the end of the day, all what, 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 what I would see is sort of, you know, the, the local version of this thing. I mean, you just sort of imagine that the, the, the W and W prime is, is you know, the difference is small, then you're up here, right? I mean, so, so on that level, I mean, so, so I, I could guess that uh, maybe if I take the continuum equation, maybe I should take that kernel, but, but that, that's a pure guess, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the next it's uh, an image. So this uh, rho, the density that parameterizes your free energy, yes. functional. I would like to understand if there is a connection to the uh, action variables of this ablovitz ladic model, because I'm more familiar with the standard inverse scattering approach, and there everything is based on the notion of action variables for your field configurations, right? And uh, and then the idea, conventional at least, would be to formulate thermodynamics and then hydrodynamics in terms of those action variables. But now I don't see, I don't understand the connection to the of the lux you introduced at the beginning. Can you okay. maybe comment on that? That's that, that, that's a very good question. So, so um, um, okay, so that that's a very aspects of the question. Let me first point out that. Uh, when you when you go to the Toda lattice, um, you know I, I use this kind of formula listening with with the lex matrix, which, which doesn't know anything about this this uh, angle and action variables actually. Um, but but uh, Benjamin I, in his paper on the Toda lattice on the classical Toda lattice, I mean you know he introduces sort of what he calls the scattering map, and 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 he sort of explains how to do um, you know the scattering theory in order to figure out. You know what? What would be this generalized free energy? So, so what? I, what I'm trying to say is that that uh, um, on the level of the Toda, I mean, you know, th th this question sort of um, um, 
at least it has been studied and then you know that there's something you can look at and then see you know whether whether you are convinced um, now now here uh, here i don't really know i mean that that's related to the fact that um, um, well of course there, no you're right i mean of course there is a scattering map uh, for them uh, for the yeah the, yeah i just don't know how to make to make this this, this connection in, in this particular case i guess it's related to to uh, the, uh, i still don't really understand you know but yeah i think it's related to the last question you posited yeah because this two particle scattering would refer to the this but, you but take two objects to two effects. But what is scattering here? I mean, you know, I mean, you know, the particles, you know, which quantity goes goes. I mean, uh, well, you're, you're saying that if I take action angle variables, I mean, then then uh, it, it's uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Maybe, they they yeah. pertain to particular modes, and then you can ask how these modes scatter asymptotically, right? Yeah. So there, this yeah. notion is well defined. Whereas in your language, it's not well defined. At least I don't understand how. how yeah. Well. Okay. So. So. so yeah. Okay. So. so I, I. Since I posed the question, I don't understand either. Right. I mean. So. But. But. I. I think what you are trying to say. No. No. I think it is something which which one should sort of be able to figure out what what that means. I mean that certainly would be illuminating because then uh, you know you could see whether whether one can sort of use the same recipe as as in the other case. I mean in the total of course you know what you mean by scattering is sort of pretty obvious, right? Can I mention just just quickly? Uh, sorry, Stefan, why? <laughs> um, just because I I think there is this there is notion of um, well that there are solitons in this uh, AL model and uh, it looks like I mean as we're discussing a bit uh, here, but it looks like uh, certain solitons, so asymptotic objects in certain limit will be representing what you are yeah, getting I, there. No, no. So so these are these should be the yes. so, so there should be some asymptotic objects which are Certain limits of certain solitons, known solitons of the AL model, that will represent that, and that will connect with uh, yeah, the, the, the the scattering picture. I, I I hear the words, but I I'm I, no I you know I, I'm sure you know <laughs> one should investigate. I, mean, I hear the words, but but the point is, you see, the, the the solitons are already sort of in some sense, you know, I mean these are made up of of many particles, so to speak, yeah. and 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 that that something which. Uh, I mean, whether the soliton scattering enters here, uh, you know, I mean, you know, you, you have to get this operator here, right? I yeah. mean, if, you know, when you look at the TBA equations, I mean, it's that operator which has yeah. to come up and I'm just not sure whether this comes in the soliton. I, I would be more right. happy if I would have sort of like, you know, I mean, what was sort of said before, I mean, you know, if you if you look at particular variables, um, in, in, in the original nonlinear Schrodinger equation, for which you can sort of define a meaningful scattering theory. Uh, yeah, I, 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 the, the solitons, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. But you know, that's open for discussion. I mean, I'm not, not saying, you know, I just don't know the answer. I mean, Thank you. you see, the, the, the point is that, I mean, if you, you of course, I, I believe I at least, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, for, let's say for the total, so I, I did this computation for Ablevich Sladek. I didn't, but but of course you can compute, well, you know, you, you have a two, two, two soliton solution uh, and then you can compute what is, what is, uh, the, the scattering of these two solitons. I mean, that, that, that's, uh, you know, that, 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 that's something which you can find in the literature. But but yeah. but I'm extremely worried that I don't think you will get that result, right? You see, you see that, that there's no freedom here. I mean, it, it, it must be this one. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And, I mean, it's just I don't whether, think, whatever you do. I don't think that. So what whatever you do, you know, there should be a concept of of uh, asymptotic yeah, objects uh, that's, or particles. Uh, you know. uh, yes, I agree on that. It's just sort of trying to find out what what is the correct what is the yeah. correct concept. Yeah, no, I agree on that. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, thanks. Oh, sorry, Stefano. So please. Yes, it's just uh, very fast because I have to run. Uh, uh, is uh, why why uh, you restrict yourself to um, uh, the dispersive case? I mean the the the, yeah. the K post. The, you the, you the, the, the defocusing. Ah, the defocusing, okay. and why not the fo the, the, fo the focus? In fact, the soliton uh, picture will make more sense because the, the solitons are more characteristic of the focusing picture. Uh, yes, well, okay. The, the, for, the for the defocusing, you have the dark solitons. That's right. I mean, for the focusing, you have uh, you have the 
the real no. solitons, so to speak. Yes. Real localized. Um, okay, that they okay. may scatter a bit. Well, so, uh, okay, so, so, so the point is that, you see, um, um, the CMV made, no, no, sorry. Uh, the, the computing these conserved quantities, I mean, that's, uh, you know, everything is completely algebraic, right? I mean, so, so uh, of course, um, you, can, you can still write down the CMV matrices. I mean, that's fine. They are no longer unitary. In fact, you know, I mean, there are just some matrices. I don't know anything about their spectrum. I mean, you can, you can uh, so, so, you know, when you look at the first slice, I mean, everything is still correct for the focusing case. But now the, the, the very first question is, um, can you say anything about the spectrum of your of your CMB matrix? And when you look in the literature, you know it, it's absolutely totally silent. I mean, CMB the, the people immediately put the unitary condition, and then you are in the defocusing case. Okay. Now we discussed this a little bit back and forth, and my impression is actually what people convince me is that. Um, um, so, um, so you know the conserved quantity, so you know you can write down what what would your potential candidate for the Gibbs measure, right? Now it looks to me that in fact, uh, if I simply write down this Boltzmann factor, it's simply infinity, and the reason is that because it's in the con and now now you see now the variables are actually in the complex plane because it's one plus, and so you know you can the, the, the alpha variables are no longer bounded. And, and when you look at it, you know, you, you, when you look at the exponential, then in some direction, I mean, it will go up exponentially. And so I don't think you can even define that, the Gibbs measure. That usually, I mean, the focusing case that usually cured because you put yourself in the canonical situation where you fix the... That's right. The, so now you have to do the canonical. And then, of course, you know, yeah, that's right. I mean, you have to do canonical in order to make sense of the Gibbs measure. And then, of course, you know, I'm, I'm, then, then uh, you know, the, the, yeah. Okay. At that, that point, I that, of then is the only question: what is this equivalence of ensemble in this situation? That's right. I mean, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, so okay, yeah. So, okay, so thank yeah, I don't know. But but the conserved quantities are still still. I mean, you know, the, the, that simple formula for the conserved quantities in terms of the powers of the CMV matrix. I mean, that 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 that, that is still correct, right? And that there will be tori presumably, and uh, I don't know. Very good. Uh, okay, Stefan, it's okay. Okay, so are there any other questions? If not, since time is over, uh, time is over, let's thank Herbert for his great talk.